Well, hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Today I'm joined by my good friend Chester. Hi, everybody. Uh, Chester, you've already said hi. You don't have to say it again. Hi, everybody. I'm feeling extra friendly today. Well, why is that? Because I get to learn about the Lord. Well, that's a good reason to be happy. And I think you had a question for me. I sure did. Last week, we learned that God chose to save some people to everlasting life by a Redeemer, right? Right? And you explained that a Redeemer is someone who buys us back from the bondage of slavery to sin, right? Right? And to explain what it meant to buy someone back, you told the story of how the prophet Hosea bought his wife back from slavery, right? Right? But... Who is the Redeemer who redeems all of us today? Batman? Superman? Even better, Chester, Godman. Godman? You can't top that, can you? Is there really a Godman? There sure is, Chester. And that leads us to our next question, and it is this. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? And who is he? Well, here's our answer right here. It's pretty long. So let's make sure that the screen can see it. The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God, became man and so was and continues to be two distinct natures and one person forever. Whew, another mouthful. But what does it all mean? Well, first of all, we see the word only in there. That means that there is only one redeemer, just one. And that is the one who buys us back from slavery to sin. Only one redeemer? Why not many? Well, simple answer is because God says so. God is the one who saves us. And he has the right to decide how we get saved. He's not a God of confusion. And you know what? The Redeemer, whom God chose to save us, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. Well, all the more reason to find out who this Redeemer is, especially if there's only one. So, the only Redeemer of God's elect... Wait! What does elect mean? Elect means chosen. God chooses those whom he saves. For example, there's sometimes countries or cities or provinces have elections. You People choose who their next prime minister or president is going to be. I see. So God chooses or elects us? That's right. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, it says, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. If God has the right to choose how people are to be saved, he most certainly has the right to choose whom he will save. Remember, God didn't have to save anyone, but because he's so kind, he has graciously decided to save his elect or chosen. Okay, keep going. Well, the only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've heard a lot about Jesus, but who exactly is he? Well, first, Jesus has the title of Lord. The Greek word for Lord is kurios, which is used in place of the word Yahweh in Hebrew. Yahweh is the name of God, the Lord, in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verse 10. So Jesus is the Lord? Jesus is God? Yes. But there's more. Jesus is also man. His human name is Jesus. And Jesus means uh, Yahweh or the Lord saves. 
is, in Hebrew, it sounds like Yeshua, and it means Yahweh saves or the Lord saves. That's strange. Why would somebody be named the Lord saves? Well, because as the angel said to Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, he said, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. So the Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, Christ is Jesus' last name, right? Oh no, I used to think that too. But Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. And it's from the Greek word Christos, which has the same meaning as the Hebrew word for Messiah. Messiah? What's a Messiah? And what's a Christ? Well, they all mean Christ means Messiah, which means anointed one. Anointed one? What does it mean to anoint someone? What's so special about it? Well, in Old Testament times, when God had chosen a person to be a king or a priest, a special man of God called a prophet would pour oil over his head. It was a special kind of olive oil with some other ingredients and it was poured over his head. Here's a picture of the prophet Samuel pouring oil on top of David's head. Samuel was telling David that he was chosen to be king and that's why he was anointed with oil. Well, if Jesus was the anointed one, was Jesus anointed? Oh yes. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Wow! So God anointed Jesus, not, not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit? Yes. And, with, and, and he anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit when Jesus was baptized. Now here's an artist's conception of what uh, the artist imagined it might have looked like. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and the Father said this. He said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hmm, so let's see if I've got this. The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God... Hey, wait, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, there is one God, but within that one Godhead are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But why is Jesus called the eternal Son of God? Why is the word eternal there? Well, eternal means no beginning and no end. The Son has always been. There never was a time when the Son of God did not exist. And he lives forever. There will never be a time when the Son will not exist. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wow, so what comes next? Well, the only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became man. Hold it. The Son of God became a man? He sure did. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word, and that Word is Jesus, or the Son of God, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. Now, dwelt means lived. So the word, that's the son. The word became flesh. And he lived, he lived among us. And flesh means that he had flesh and bones and skin and blood and all that. That he was a real human being. But why did he become a man? So that he could be our mediator. A mediator? What's that? Well, a mediator is someone who comes between two persons or groups and brings them together. Jesus is our mediator. We were separated from God by our sin, but Jesus came between the Father and us and brought us back together. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So he was God and man back then, but not anymore, right? Oh, yes. Jesus continues to be God and man forever. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with the same human body that he had when he lived among us on earth. You know, G when Jesus rose from the dead and he saw D Thomas, the one who doubted that Jesus had rose from the dead, he showed him his hands and his side and he said, Thomas, put your, put your hands in my and touch my hands and see the nail prints where Jesus was fastened to the cross. And he said, put your hand into my side and, and, and see where that wound was, where the soldier thrust the spear in. You see, Jesus was, was telling Thomas that he was the same Jesus. He was, it was the same body that came to life. Well, but if Jesus is God and man, then that means he's two persons, right? Nope. Jesus is one person, but he has two distinct natures. Jesus is one person, but has two distinct natures. Oh, well, what are they? Um, well, Jesus has a divine nature, which means he's God, but he also has a human nature, which means that he's a man. So a divine nature, meaning he's, which means he's God, and a human nature, which means he's man. Wow, does the Bible actually say all this? Oh, yes, it does. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, when we read the Gospel of John, and we read later on, we learn that the Word is God the Father's Son. And that Son is the Word, and he is both God and he is with God. But in John 1.14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt or lived among us. Now, became flesh means that the Word or the Son became human. He had flesh and bones, muscle and blood. He was a real human being like you and like me and like you. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, when speaking of Jesus, says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, we read, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But why was it so important for Jesus to be both God and man? Well, let's think about it. Who sinned and brought all this sin and misery to humankind? Adam. And what was Adam? A man, a human being. So if someone was going to be a substitute to take man's place and being punished for our sins, what kind of being ought to take our place? A human, an animal, or a spirit? A human, correct. So the one who would redeem us ought to be a human being. Now, in order to be our substitute and take our place in being punished for our sins, would our su substitute have to be sinful or perfect? Well, perfect, of course. If our substitute was sinful, he would have to die for his own sins and not ours. Excellent, Chester. So our substitute redeemer would have to be a man and a perfect man with no sins of his own to deal with. Now, there wasn't just one man to redeem because there were millions of people descended from Adam and Eve. Yeah, all people come from Adam and Eve. Now think of this. What being could possibly be a substitute for all of God's chosen people? Countless numbers of human beings and each human being with countless numbers of sins that need to be forgiven, atoned for, dealt with. Yeah, that's an enormous job. And who's the only one who could handle that job? Only God could deal with all that. Precisely, Chester. So that's why Jesus had to be both fully God and fully man. Two distinct natures in one person. 
When Jesus died on the cross for the sins of his people, he was a man, our substitute and representative taking our place. He was punished for, for all the sins of all his people. But because he was God, he could live the perfect life and his death was of such infinite value that his death was sufficient. His death was good enough to atone for all the sins of all his people. You know, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Christ hung on a tree when he hung on the cross. Okay, so I think I understand why we need Jesus to be God and man when he died on the cross. But why does he still need to be God and man? Because he still represents us before God as our high priest. Jesus is our high priest? Yes. In Old Testament times, a priest would offer sacrifices for the sins of, pe of the people and intercede, that is, pray for them. And as our great high priest, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, and he, and he, and he intercedes for us. In order for Jesus to be our high priest, in order to represent us, he has to be one of us. He has to be a man speaking on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, he, that is Jesus, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. With Jesus representing us, we will be completely saved because our high priest is at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on our behalf. Astounding. You know, the more I learn about Jesus, the more awesome I realize that he is. And no matter how much you study, you will still find more and more wonderful things about Jesus. Well, that's all for today, folks. Lord willing, We'll see you again next week. And remember, the only Redeemer of God's elect, God's chosen people, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. God bless you, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week.